Hello, welcome to Video with Soul. This is a podcast where we explore the heart and soul of the real estate industry. I'm your host, Colin Nathan Aleem, the real estate boy, and together we'll be diving into the stories and experiences of professionals who are dedicated to serving the underserved communities in the real estate industry. So whether you're a real estate professional, a home buyer, or simply interested in the real estate industry, this show is for you. So join us as we dive into the world of real estate with soul. So I have a special guest today. Today, I want to introduce him, uh, Je- Jeffrey Vilk uh, from Fulton Bank. He's a mortgage sales manager. Welcome to the show, Jeff. Thank you, Colin. Pleasure to be here. Awesome, awesome, man. Well, listen, man, how was your week, man? How was your week in the real estate industry? Week's been busy. We're definitely seeing a turnaround in the housing market, so applications are definitely up. I think it's a combination of rates have kind of leveled off, kind of saw a little bit of a dip, but as well as there's just a substantial amount of grand opportunity in the Philadelphia market. So we're definitely seeing an uptick in opportunity and applications. So. Gotcha, man. This is your second time on Real Estate with Soul, man. But why don't you tell the public as far as the the um, areas that you serve? Sure. I cover mostly all of Philadelphia. So that's always been my concentration. That's always been my focus. Um, Cause I feel like in order to serve Philadelphia, you have to understand Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's really the areas that I cover the most, anywhere from first time home buyers all the way up through medical professionals. So I always try to, you know, learn the more specialized niche products, okay. the ones that are more difficult to, you know, complete. Uh, so, I mean, really it's Philadelphia. I mean, I serve the surrounding counties as well, but my focus has always been mainly Philadelphia. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. And I, I guess, what have you seen? Um, I mean, it's 2024 now. So I guess what have, what's the biggest difference that you've seen this year from last year? Last year, I think everybody got scared. The rates rose at like a rapid rate, which I think caught everybody off guard right. to the level that they rose. And again, as quickly as they rose. Um, so it slowed so many loan officers down almost to like a screeching halt. Um, you know, if you were keeping track there, the amount of loan officers that have left the industry, I think realtors as well has been, you know, staggering. So I think on the plus side, we're definitely seeing the loan officers that are remaining are usually the more seasoned veterans, the ones that are, you know, prepared for this type of housing market. Um, so, but I think like right now, everybody's seeing sort of that, like I said, more applications coming through, more housing opportunities coming through, more development being built. Um, it's definitely great to see how many um, houses are going up for sale in Philadelphia, how many new constructions are being done in Philadelphia. Um, so like we're, we have a benefit that most markets don't, which is again, having buyers is great. Having a house for them to buy is really going to be the important component. Um, so, you know, later, I guess we'll talk about like the turn to key initiatives. We'll talk about the new developments that are going up, um, things that are trying to keep up with the housing demand in our market. Right. I think before we get into that, um, being a real estate agent, I know how important it is to find a quality real estate agent. Um, as a real estate agent, you're, you're really quarterbacking um, the buyer or the, the seller's entire process. But why don't you why don't you speak to the importance of follow um, of finding a quality um, loan officer versus just going down to your bank? Because I'll speak with a lot of um, first time home buyers and I'll ask them, um, are you pre-approved? And if they're not, their their plan most of the time is to go down to the local bank and get a pre-approval. So why don't you talk about the um, differences, I guess, in the quality of loan officers and what type of impact that makes on a buyer's experience? I mean, as a loan officer, I will say um, the loan officer, not necessarily the bank or institution, but the loan officer that you're working with does matter. I mean, you use the word quarterback of the transaction, but the loan officer that you have is your representative of your file. So when you submit an application, that loan officer's job is to make sure that it's complete and accurate, as well as following guidelines. So, you know, for the realtors and bars that have heard those horror stories of deals blowing up in the 12th hour, it's usually just because the loan officer might not have done the due diligence properly up front. So, you know, checking out your local bank, that's not the problem. But like, if you're dealing with the loan officer that doesn't ask you questions, um, that's usually kind of like the first red flag. 
if you're a first time home buyer and you're, using, you're trying to utilize grant opportunity, you might disqualify yourself or get discouraged just because the institution that that loan officer works with doesn't have a product that suits your needs. So I, I think it's great that realtors that partner with multiple lenders to know and keep a bar from getting discouraged, like what opportunities are out there so that, you know, just because you go to one place and they say no, doesn't mean everybody's going to say no. So knowing what questions to ask, knowing what you're looking for. I also like, again, because of what I specialize with first-time home bars, even partnering with the right housing counselor, because most of the grant opportunities are going to require that, um, is definitely, you know, you have to also have a loan officer that can help guide you as well. And if you can get the right loan officer and the right realtor combination, I mean, those are the deals that you see get to the finish line. So. Right. No, I totally agree. I totally agree. A lot of times we'll see these headlines um, where they'll say, for example, uh, black and brown uh, buyers are two thirds or something like this, some type of statistic to get turned down for loans um, than their white counterparts. And sometimes um, when, when I'm looking at this, it's like, OK, it's probably clickbait, number one. Um, but number two, it does lie. And this is me talking is that it lies in the loan officer that you have because they're really on yeah. your side as far as to um, get you prepared, almost like a trainer. If we're looking at somebody to go into a mm -hmm. fight, if, if we're going to if we're going to compare um, underwriting to a, a fight, the loan officer mm -hmm. is kind of like your trainer as far as to get you prepared to meet the processor who ultimately decides whether you get the loan or not. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I mean, I can give you my personal thoughts. I'm sure there's statistics as well, but uh, and I follow the statistics, but like my visual observation, again, the team that I cover and the amount of applications I see come through, taking the the color component out of it or the demographic or the nationality. But what ends up happening is loan officers, like, like I said before, loan officers are kind of like your, you know, they're the ones advocating. They're the ones that are putting the file together. There's things that happen in the back end after the information is obtained. Now keep in mind that income calculation could be wrong because you might've switched jobs. You might be hourly. They might not have used your overtime properly. They might not have asked you if you collect child support or pay child support. There's what I call like these additional variables that if you're a loan officer that's used to, let's just use a like a an accountant, right? You're an accountant. Chances are, you know, your income is stable, the money's in the bank, there's no moving parts. Anybody can do those loans. As soon as you start throwing in these variables, where you have to start paying attention to what we call in the mortgage industry, like overlays, you have to pay attention to the debt to income ratio, you have to pay attention to the credit score, the items that are on the credit, if there's disputes or not. It gets complicated. I'm going to use that word. It gets complicated. Not all loan officers are built the same mm -hmm. to handle that complication. So they'll default to say, you know, colleague, you're my applicant. I'll say, I'm sorry, it just doesn't work. And just have a nice day. And that's why you'll hear, like, I don't understand why one lender said no, and then another lender said yes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the bank gets that name, but it's really the loan officer you deal with. You could, there are scenarios, you can go to the same bank, talk to two different loan officers, one can get you approved, one might not. And not because they don't want to, they just might not know how to. Mm. So it's not like every loan officer goes through the, through the strict training. That's really up to the loan officer, which is why you'll always see realtors, when they pair with a loan officer that knows how to get it done, they'll only want that to happen. And one, one trend I've noticed that newer loan officers that get into real estate, if a buyer comes pre-approved, they'll say, okay, they're pre-approved, like, no, you know, you got it, we'll move on, let's get on the contract, let's get them in the house. But when they learn when that file blows up because they didn't know that there was additional liabilities, they didn't know they didn't do all the due diligence up front. Mm. That's what I call like trial by fire. Okay. Then they start asking their realtor counterparts, like, what do I do here? It's like, call my guy. You now it's not that the, my guy has a magician, it's just that my guy might be more diligent in that credit profile to know how to get it to the closing table. It might have been simple as like, did you adjust the liabilities? Did you do a verification of employment to make sure you can like explain to the underwriter why we're using more income calculation than the underwriter wanted to? So you can get into the really the granular level, but that's where the loan officer really does matter. And it's not, it is clickbait what you're talking about in the beginning, but you'll see, and I don't want to use like institutions names, but there are ma major headlines where banks are notorious for it. Right. Um, 
for denials. But like I said, it's just because once things get murky or complicated, that loan officer just wants to move on to the next deal. Mm. So like if you come in and you got multiple jobs and child support and liabilities and you don't have enough cash to close, you got to start asking for seller's assist and grants and gifts. That loan officer, might, their head might start spinning, but I'm going to work on this next deal where the person came, they have their job, they have their money, they have their credit. I'm going to work on the easy one. Right, 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 so, right, right. And, so and that's, that. no, that, that definitely explained everything. And that's why I tell people, you got to find people that care. I mean, they have to have the wherewithal, yeah. they have to have the knowledge, but at the end of the day, they have to care. And a mm -hmm. lot of times, and this isn't all the time, but a lot of times when you go down to your local bank per se, um, they they may not have a mortgage lender in the office and they may mm -hmm. ship you to somebody, a call center in Idaho. And now mm -hmm. you're talking to Joe Blow in Idaho and they don't know you or there's mm -hmm. no connection. So like you said, some something something hard comes up or one hurdle comes up and they want to just move on to the next one because they're getting 100 or 102 different leads every day um, because right. they're just behind a desk, man. So um, let's move on to some more positive things, man. We got some good yeah. things going on in Philadelphia. Um I, I really feel like there's an initiative in Philadelphia for people to become homeowners. And I think right. this is um, being pushed at the local level. And I also feel like it's being pushed at the state level. Um, what's your thoughts about that? I mean, absolutely. Every time I blink, uh, a new initiative is coming out where to make housing more affordable. Um, I think the number one Aside from credit, you'll hear credit a lot, but look, once you overcome that, one of the bigger things about affordability is going to be the cash to close component, savings. Right. Um, so the amount of initiatives specifically in Philadelphia, it's almost difficult to keep track. And I mean, between the mortgage products that, up, that have down payment assistance, I posted yesterday, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac also just came out with a new one. If you're in low income, um, mm. an additional up to $2,500, you're going to apply towards down payment and closing costs. I mean, it's literally every which way they're trying to find a way to keep bridging the gap to make housing more affordable. The more in Philadelphia, now again, I'm a Philly guy. I'm sure there's other markets, you know, in Delaware, Virginia, like as you move south, but it, it, in Philadelphia specifically, the amount of opportunity, even the, and you were saying on the state level, on the local level, housing organizations that also have down payment assistance, just by going through them as counseling, you can get an additional couple thousand dollars. Um, first front doors opening up, you know, from the federal home loan bank, they just found a way to increase that. So if everybody that's listening on the, on this, um, you know, this first front door used to be 5,000, it's going to be 15,000. That's a three to one increase. I mean, it's, it's every which way you're looking, they're trying to make it so that the cash to close is not going to be your obstacle in home ownership. Um, and still, by the way, finding ways to make, uh, the mortgage products more affordable as well, which has been terrific. So. Right. Um, I think I really want to talk about the one that has really impressed me, has impressed you, um, that was just rolled out recently. I mean, this is a product that I feel like is the mothership, as they say, um, of products. <laughs> so why don't, why don't we just kind of um, dive in this to, into this initiative, um, kind of mm -hmm. go from A to Z as far as the product, um, what it entails, what are the benefits, who qualifies, um, let's okay. jump. Let's just jump right into it. So I do want to start with this is a pilot program, right? Okay. So the program has a set amount of loans that they're willing to do. Um, it's still available, and I think because of the, if they were looking for the success rate of the program, I think they're going to get it. So hopefully the pro product stays long term and just becomes a product. But this was specifically for Philadelphia, for Philadelphia residents. You also have to be a first-time home buyer. So I'm going to repeat, repeat that one more time. You have to be a Philadelphia resident. You can't be locating to Philadelphia. You, know, you can't be living in the surrounding counties or Jersey and want to move to Philly. So current resident, you have to be a first-time home buyer. Once, um, once you fit those two requirements, you need to have at least a 640 credit score. It has to be a conventional loan. So you have to qualify for a conventional loan um, with at least a 640 credit score. Now, again, when I was talking about affordability, there's no mortgage insurance on the loan. Hmm. So basically what this is, it's like the PHFA KFIT loan, right? So KFIT is 5% of the sales price. No cap as long as it's within their allowable limit. So 5% of the sales price is a grant provided to you that's forgiven in 10 years, 10% 10 forgiven per year. 
Here's the caveat to what they added onto this program. This is what the pilot program is. They're going to give you an additional up to 25000 That money can be used to bridge the gap between down payment and closing costs. So remember, you're getting 5% from the KFIT grant. Then you're going to get an additional separate, an additional 25, up to up to 25000 Once you use that, um, you can use any remaining funds. So if you don't need all 25000 the remaining funds can be used to pay down or pay off student loan debt. And that's the part that I thought, like when I saw it, I had to do a double take. I'm like, interesting. Because again, aside from housing affordability, I think one of the biggest hot topics is student loans. And student loans, um, you know, keeping people from being able to buy due to affordability as well. Right. Now, now you said that this has to be a conventional loan. Um, Correct. From my experience, people who have 640s usually need to go FHA. So mm -hmm. I guess, how are they bridging that? Are they, I don't want to say forcing people into, would you be forcing them in, like, some, like someone has a 640. Um, mm -hmm. And most of the time, if a person has a 640, it makes sense for them to do FHA um, because the pricing of the conventional loan would be, it wouldn't make sense. I guess, what what do you think would happen in that situation? Somebody has a 640. It's tough. Like, so there's only a couple of banks that are doing this, again, as part of the pilot. It's, um, up to, so you, you brought up an interesting point, right? 640, there's pricing adjustments, et cetera. One of the, remember I was talking about ways that we're making things more affordable. Mm. There's two agencies. I'm going to get off this product for a second, but one thing to answer your question about the affordability part because of the adjustments and FHA becoming a, used to be a good product to lean on for affordability. Mm -hmm. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. So if you're within the income limit, there are no loan, what they call loan level price adjustments. So if it's because of loan to value, credit score, et cetera. So for example, at Fulton, we have um, two conventional loans that we do that are, do not require loan level price adjustments and that have no mortgage insurance. Mm. they could potentially become a better alternative okay. because you're concerned exactly what you just said, exactly for those reasons or why those, these changes keep occurring. Why were people leaning on FHA for exactly what you said? Because it might be more affordable because if you're on a lower credit score, even getting the approval might be more difficult or it might be a more expensive loan. So they found ways to solve that problem. Now you still have to get an approval. That's a different story, but that's why, I, you know, there are different programs that you can, the score itself, if anything, I want to share on this call, the 640, it's a starting point of the conversation. What's on your credit is really what's being utilized by the system that's reviewing it. So the 640 is a score, but how recent are your lates? How many lates? How many you know collections, judgments, et cetera? Like, what is your current credit report telling? What story is it telling? So I've seen people with 680 scores get denied. I've seen people with 640 scores get approved. 640 just starts the conversation for everything else, meaning what's your debt to income ratio? right? How much mm -hmm. money you have versus the house you want to buy. If you're already pushing the max and you have a low credit score and you don't have any assets, are you in a position for success in purchasing a home? And that's one of the things I don't think gets discussed enough. It's like, what position, like what story are you telling the bank? If you're trying to buy a house and your debt to income ratio is low and you have what they call reserves, meaning after you purchase your home, you'll still have money in the bank. That 640 then doesn't necessarily stop you. But that's why, like, the higher the credit score, that kind of offsets those other risks. Mm. So you got to look at, like, a balancing act. Right, 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 right. Now, so I guess what your advice be if somebody does want to take advantage, they really need to get, I want to say pre-approved first before they go through the actual program, even though the program says that you have to go through the program before you get pre-approved. I never said that, but you have you have to go through the you have to go through the program. From what I've seen, you have to go through the program before you can sign an agreement of sale. All oh, right, that's what I thought. Um, there's nowhere because they can't. The, the, they're not going to stop you if you've been pre-approved. How do you want to know like, where you stand? Yeah, how do you yeah. police so, that? Yeah, like you're. That's not a discouragement. Um, and also to finish the um, the program, you need to get a pre-approval for them to finish the certificate. Um, I think properly, but that's why it's like. There's also an alternative. So like, remember, PHFA, KFIT, you can go conventional FHA. Mm. There is an option. Like if you don't hit that criteria just yet, you can go to, you know, to an FHA option if that's absolutely necessary. Okay, so it does sound, I mean, I think we're in agreement that 
um, if you do want to take advantage of this program, you need to get pre-approved first. So we need to sit somebody, sit down with somebody like you, um, look at the information and kind of see because you have options. I mean, this mm-hmm. one is um, probably one of the best options out there, but you have other options. Like you just mentioned, you have the um, first front door, which is now $15,000. And correct me if I'm wrong, but you can stack that with yeah. the Philly first, which will yeah. give you $25,000. That's correct? Correct. Right. So th- there's, oh, no, go ahead. And plus, and like internally, you know, um, most lenders have their own grants. We have our Currently, we're up to twenty five hundred dollars ourselves. We're, you know, we're in the process of increasing that. Um, so once you start, and I love that word, like once you find a way to stack the grants, that really I think puts people in position for success. I'm, I'm a huge advocate of if you can use the grant money and save cash for when you purchase your home. Um, I think that's really the biggest. Uh, it's like as a loan, like, like that's the biggest benefit I think of the grant. Like besides being able to purchase the home, but hopefully have the money left over because now you're the homeowner. So you want to be prepared for anything that happens in the home. There's no landlord to call. So that's why I always find like when you're purchasing a home, if you're using every dollar available to purchase it, remember now you're responsible for everything inside that home. Heaters, air conditioner, if there's leaks, roof, like you name it. Right. And that's most, like you said earlier, that's most people's hurdle is the down payment because you're already paying a payment. Um, whether Mm -hmm. that's rent or whether you're paying your folks because you live at home, but you're already paying a monthly payment. So that's not going to stop. But what that's um, actually, that's why I find it funny. The one thing like, and you see like, you know, you talk about clickbait and you say about people that are sitting on the fence, is it the right time to buy? I'm like, unless you're living at home, like, you know, like with your parents or somebody, you don't have a housing expense. You're not eliminating the expense. It's like, I don't know what the bad or good time, but it's, you're not like, you know, you're going to pay something somewhere. You're not going from, I don't want to pay a mortgage. I'd rather rent. Like, I'm not sure the savings, but the unfortunate thing is the people that were smart enough to take advantage. Like if you're, if you're able to afford it today and you can buy it today, uh-huh. I posted a thing a couple of days ago when they show how much equity you could have built, there's no equity in renting. So the people right. that do that comparison, like if you can afford the house, it's a forced savings account. You're building equity. You're building something of value because if you if the worst of the worst happens and you ever have to sell your house, most of the time you're walking away with something. Right. Because that money you were putting in is building equity. You're paying down the principal balance. When rent, if you hit hard times and you can't pay your rent and they evict you, you walk out with nothing. And that's the part that I always have trouble, like where people say, like, I don't know if it's a good time to buy or rates are high. But if you're waiting for rates to get low, you can always refinance. Right. Like, you don't, you know, that's that's one thing. It's like one of my like personal pet peeves when I hear that. Like, oh, I'm going to wait. You're going to wait while everybody takes the house that you could have bought. <laughs> right. So, I mean, <laughs> right. And on top of that, um, if you're paying rent, you're paying 100%. Yeah. Your your percentage, your interest rate is 100% if, yeah. you're, if you're, you're renting. So it doesn't matter what the interest rate is, whether it's yeah. 10%, 15%, if it was that. Um, that's less than a hundred percent. So I guess the advice is to see if you can get pre-approved, see how much you can get pre-approved for and see how much house you can buy and see if you find an adequate house out there that meets your criteria. But the name of the game is to get off the fence and get in the game. Yeah. You know, so, um, okay. So we, um, talked about the, um, the revitalization neighborhood grant. Um, we 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 got the first front door grant. That's fifteen thousand dollars. What do we have to do to get that fifteen thousand dollars for the first front door grant? So the way that grant operates, the lender. So you have to go to a lender that has it, that has access to those funds. We qualified the borrower, and we're able to reserve those funds for six months. Okay. So if you're trying to utilize it, you have to pair up with a lender that has it, and then you have to make sure to apply, and then they'll submit the request for a reservation and if approved you'll have those funds you'll have access to those funds for up to six months okay and what- unless they change it now remember like when the program goes live if there's any nuances we'll, we'll update but that's how the historically that's how it's been okay and um historically also they run out of money so this is so that's the thing about the reservations the thing is like you gotta it's like a double-edged sword it's like you want the comfort of knowing listen if i apply for it I'm going to have that money reserved. Great. Mm. But what happens to all that money when the people don't buy? Mm. Doesn't There's no time for it to go back into the pool. So it, it accumulates. So it's like it's 
people that might have needed it don't have the opportunity if they didn't get it early enough. Mm-hmm. But then you got people that reserved it but never do anything, never buy the house. Right. So, but in general, um, this first front door, I mean, it comes and it goes. It comes and it goes. Yeah. I guess yeah. I'm I'm saying that is um, if you are again, it doesn't cost you anything, and I think I think that's one of the things that gets me. It doesn't cost you anything to see if you're mm-hmm. ready to buy a home. It's a yeah. conversation. It's a conversation, yeah. and some people are hesitant about the credit pull. Listen. The hard pull on your credit is only 10% of mm-hmm. the credit score. It's only 10%. So if you get your credit pulled to see if your credit ready, it's worth it. And what do you have the credit score for anyway? Um, I guess you you could talk to somebody per se, um, like a Jeff, a mortgage lender, and not get your, your credit um, pulled, but it's a test run. In order to find out truly whether you're ready to buy a home or not and what you can afford, they need to pull your credit. And this is okay. one of the hangups that I have with a lot of people is, oh, I don't want to get my credit pulled. Oh, I don't want to get my credit pulled. Hey, listen, your credit might go down by a point or two. But if you sit on the sideline and you don't buy and you rent, I mean, you're in a lot worse shape. Than if you buy a home, and I think in the last two years in Philadelphia, homes have gone up an average of, of like 31%. That's mm-hmm. equity that you've missed out on because you didn't want somebody to pull your credit. Um, <laughs> how do you handle that when, when people call you and they want to get pre-approved and they want to know how much they can afford, but they don't want to get their, their credit pulled? I mean, I'll tell them. We can talk all day. It's not going to answer your questions. Mm. Um I do let them know, like, uh, you know, in this day and age, there's multiple ways to follow your credit. Because I know there's some people that don't know what shows up on their credit. And then there's some people that, like, I'm not an advocate of credit karma because the score is not even close to what we use. But the right. content, uh, you know, what it's reporting right. will tell you, like, hey, do you have collections? Do you have high balances? You know, you'll know. You should know financially where you're at. You can't go in blind. Right. And I think that goes with financial education. It's like your credit score mortgage aside, really is a factor for everything you do. If you want to buy a car, even if you want to lease an apartment, you know, if you want to rent, they're still pulling your credit. It's not like they're just going to like look at you and say, hey, nice person, like we'll rent to them. Right. Your credit score is like your resume for anything you want to do. You want to get a credit card, you want to do anything, you need a credit score. So knowing what's on there is important. So if you don't want to get your credit score pulled, at least have a reason. Like I know it's not there because I'm, you know, my balances at the moment are high and I saw a huge drop in my score. I missed payments recently. I saw my score drop. Like if you have a plan, fine. But also keep in mind, there's a lot of free resources to be able to review and point, like monitor your credit. So I would do that as well. But if you don't know what's going on in your credit and you're afraid for it to take a hit, you know, to have a hard inquiry, if there's ever a time to have your credit pulled, it's to buy a house. Right. Like I don't know what you're saving it for if not to have it pulled to buy a house. <laughs> I admit, have your best foot forward. Right. Because if you're maxed out, it's interesting when I see the reaction of people They've never missed a payment, but the score is low. The government understand I never missed a payment. But if you look at the limit of the accounts and the balances, if you're maxed out, think about what you're telling the credit bureau. How are they going to slow you down from taking out new credit if they see that you can't pay down your balances? They're going to lower your score. So there's a lot of things like you were talking about the 10% factor of like having the credit pulled. But believe me, it's that should be the least of the worries. Right. Um, it's really, and then once you put your credit, it's good for 120 days. So you have, you know, 120 days to purchase your home. If this, you know, but right. credit's a good, a good, um, that's a common topic, but I, I will say that the average person home buyer, I don't come across that often. You'll have the bar that's got like 800 credit, doesn't want to pull it, but I'm like, listen, when you're ready, it's up to you. Like, that's fine. But it's a different conversation when you're trying to figure out if you can be approved, then it's a necessary evil. You got to pull it. Right. One of the, um, what Jeff was alluding to was your credit utilization. Um, your credit mm-hmm. utilization is your credit limit versus how much credit you're actually using on that limit. So, for example, if your credit limit was a thousand dollars and you're using five hundred dollars of it, that's fifty percent. Your credit utilization mm-hmm. score is fifty percent. So, in order for credit utilization to uh, not hurt you, it needs to be around thirty percent. Um, but for it to help you, it needs to be around maybe like 5%. And um, people got to understand not to get too deep in credit, but there's two dates that you need to be aware of. It's the statement date 
and the um and the uh, due date the uh, due date is when you actually need to pay the credit card the statement date is when they basically rat on you or or tell the credit bureau as far as how much you owe that's the date that you need to be aware of because like jeff said you can have a person that says oh well i pay my um credit card bills on time i pay them up well the the due date may be on the 30th but if you got over a 30 percent credit utilization on the 15th which is your statement date then mm -hmm. you kind of defeat in the purpose so i see people all day with beat up credit um and like you said the number one they may say well i don't have any credit cards um which people got to understand that the credit score is basically off of credit cards. If you don't have a credit card and you're not using the credit card, um, then a lot of times if you don't have credit, that's worse than having bad credit to a lot of institutions. Um, so this um, credit is kind of like its own language per se, um, not hard. You, you can do a little bit of research on YouTube and um, find out the different rules on how to play this credit game. But moving on, um, we talked about the uh, first front door. The, yeah, the first front door. Um, mm -hmm. We talked about the Philly First. I guess what other um, grant or loan forgiveness programs in Philadelphia do we have out there? So, if you're buying in West Philadelphia, there's a um, like Urban League Housing Counseling Agency does up to two thousand dollars. The True Grant. You know, there's no timeline, there's no lien, you know, it goes to the, they wire the money to the closing table. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that doesn't get talked about enough, which I think is, has two huge benefits, is what they call IDA, like uh, the pot, like the, um, savings accounts mm -hmm. with these organizations that if you put in money up to like 2000, they do a two to one match. Mm -hmm. So if you put in 2000, they'll match it with four, you have to save it over a couple months. Um, I don't think that's talked about anywhere near enough. So if you have time, you again, you partner with the right agency, you can open up this, you know, they tell you where to open up the checking account. You have to show that you're able to make X amount of deposits, but they'll do a two to one match, you know, and that's your money. It's not a, there's no lien, there's nothing else to it. Like if you qualify and you put in $2,000, which you should save anyway, right. and then they're gonna automatically give you 4,000, that gives you $6,000. Wow. Just to put it in perspective, if you're buying a two hundred thousand dollar house and the mortgage requires three percent down, that's six thousand dollars. That's your down payment right there. Before you even talk about any of the grants and any other opportunities, well, and I don't I, think that's talked about anywhere near enough. No, that's why I said two huge benefits. You you get in the habit of saving, and they're also getting a, you're automatically getting a two to one match. Like if somebody told you, "Hey, Colin, you you give me a dollar, I'll give you three back." That's a good, that's a good, all that's day. a good percentage, you know, all day, all day. And that's funny because one of my um, buyers did mention that the other day. And what, um, what I usually tell people, because I run into a lot of people who don't have, they probably don't have the credit, but they don't have the savings either. Um, but what I did when I bought my first house many, many moons ago is I took about 10%, no, about 20% out of my paycheck because I had a nine to five at that time. Um, and mm -hmm. I put it, I got it automatically deducted um, from my paycheck and it went into, I opened up this online savings account so it could go directly to that savings account. So I can't see it anymore. And it sounds like this program is kind of doing the same thing, but at the same time, matching the money that is put in there by the, the uh, buyer. Yep. Fantastic. Okay. But see now, what you're saying, that's the hardest part. Like when you're talking about the savings, because right. a lot of people think it's about income. It's not because I've seen plenty of people that make over a hundred thousand a year have no savings. And the problem is the more money you make, you can disqualify yourself sometimes from these opportunities, mm -hmm. from grants, et cetera. But then you also don't have any money saved. So it makes, and in that case, it makes home ownership like really out of reach. Um, but yeah, anytime you can automate the savings, which is why it's interesting you said that. I always call like when you own a, when you own a home and you have a mortgage, it's a forced savings account because every time you make your monthly payment, a percentage goes to equity and a percentage goes to interest. That's how you're automatically gaining equity in the property because whether you like it or not, as long as you pay your mortgage, you're building equity, whether you want to or not, right? And that, that's it's funny that you said that. It's like, I always call it an automated savings account. Okay. Now you're, you're automatically building equity. Right, right. And, and I mean, uh, going out there and speaking to in, individuals in Philadelphia, I always tell them that the base, my personal belief, is that the base of generational wealth is home ownership. 
Yeah. It's, it's home ownership. That's the basis of generational wealth because when most people pass, the um, biggest asset that they transfer to their heirs is their home. Mm -hmm. And that's what people got to understand. I mean, there's no doubt. Yeah, the equity and the, the value that you're building and the fact that you can, again, it's an asset you can pass along because the average, like I said, the, you know, it's no secret. The savings in the, in the country in general as a whole, it's almost non-existent. Right. So that's why, like, the average person that applies for a mortgage, especially the ones that think, like, you still they got that 20% down mentality. <laughs> got to have 20% down. Got to have 20% down. Right. Um, but luckily, enough, you know, enough realtors in the market, enough loan officers in the market, and housing organizations to keep just making sure people understand you can purchase a home. And also keep in mind, like, if the community is not purchasing homes, then you're going to start getting more developers purchasing homes and making communities unaffordable. So it's like, that's one of the things like when, like the importance of home ownership, mm -hmm. when you think about the community, you want to have a representation of the community. Okay, how are you? If people aren't buying homes and then, you know, developers come in and they just start putting up apartment complexes, you know, luxury condos, et cetera, like it changes the community. Right. right. Yep. And you definitely have that going on in uh, University City right now. Um, mm -hmm of the luxury condos or mid luxury condos that are going up, man. So I, I, I think people get it. Um, if you are listening to this um, conversation, wherever you're getting it from, um, I guess the name of the game is to get off the sidelines. And even if you're not ready, contact us so we can get you ready. Okay. Yeah. Because a, a lot of times you need something to push you to get that credit fixed or to start that savings account. Um, and the thing is, is that you don't have to be ready right now to contact us, uh, contact us, and then we'll be able to tell you what to do to streamline you as far as to get you to the point where you can afford a home because Philadelphia, I even seen this on bigger pockets. I think yesterday where the year over year, um, appreciation in Philadelphia was one of the largest in the country last year. So philadelphia right philadelphia is still affordable if you're comparing it to new york if you're comparing it to dc it's still affordable but it will not be like that forever so mm -hmm. again if you want to make philadelphia your home if you live in philadelphia um now is the time before everything gets bought up absolutely you know so um jeff why don't you tell them where they can find you at sure i don't know if my information's at the bottom um you know, you can, I mean, reach me on Facebook, you know, it's, it's under my name, same with Instagram, Jeffrey Vilk. Um, I do have, after we're done uh, the podcast, I'll put my contact information. I have a mobile app that you can use, um, which makes it very really easy to just, you know, you can text it and it can arrive. Uh, so I'll put that contact information, my cell phone number is 267-736-7962. Best way to reach me. Awesome. Awesome. And if um, for, for some reason um, you still need to reach out to Jeff, you can always reach out to me and I'll connect you. Um, and again, this is Colin Nathan Aleem, the real estate boss. If you're looking to buy a home, sell a home or invest in real estate, I got you, man. Any last words for the audience? OK, Jeff popped off somehow. <laughs> so we are never had that happen before. Oh, there he goes. Um, any last thing yeah, sorry, you buddy. want to say? No, I think we covered a, a lot of great, um, great opportunities. I hope people got a lot of value out of it. Uh, got people excited or at least encouraged to start the process if they haven't yet. And maybe we covered something that, you know, somebody was concerned about that. I think now they might be more comfortable taking that, you know, that leap of faith. So yeah, take that step to home ownership. Yep. And I, I just want to just restate for the record. Listen, they got a grant program out there where you can get close to sixty thousand dollars and some of that money you can use towards your student loans. So that's definitely a game changer. Um, contact us to see if you're eligible. And um, if there's nothing else, I will see you guys next week. Take care.